This is Duke University. Seminar this semester on cyber surveillance policy and privacy law. And as you know, our guest speaker is Stephen Lacar. Um, he is a Duke Law alum, so we're so pleased to welcome him back home, class of 1973. And if some of you don't know, there's a very interesting backstory with Duke Law School and the U.S. v. Jones case. So not only did we have a Duke Law alum representing Antoine Jones before the Supreme Court, but Michael Dreben, who was arguing the case on behalf of the government, is Deputy Solicitor General, and he argued the case um, on behalf um, of the government. So you had two Duke Law alums in the Supreme Court on a landmark case and doing us proud. So, um, and also, um, Steve Lacar joined with Walter Dellinger um, of our faculty um, in litigating this case. So there was a very strong Duke Law presence in this very, very prominent case that was featured in every major media outlet on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, and, and it was really, really wonderful to have um, Duke Law represented so well. And as you know, this was um, the case about, or I'm, I'm sure you know, about the warrantless GPS tracking 24-7 um, and the constitutionality of that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the very esteemed career of uh, Mr. Lekar. So after he graduated from Duke Law School, he began his career as a legislative assistant for United States Senator Herman Talmadge. He then served as a trial attorney with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in Washington, D.C., and was principally responsible for investigating and prosecuting commodity futures and commodity options fraud cases. Then he entered private practice in 1978 and concentrated on federal commercial litigation and business counseling. His litigation expertise includes handling complex and sensitive cases involving injunctive actions and administrative proceedings and also congressional oversight investigations and grand jury probes. He's represented many high-level officials, um, including individuals whom the Federal Trade Commission has accused of illegally obtaining customers' confidential financial information and extensive litigation experience in civil RICO cases and securities and commodity anti-fraud cases. But in addition to that, he has extensive litigation experience in complex criminal matters, and including the U.S. v. Jones case, and successfully argued U.S. v. Jones, um, the landmark decision on limitless um, or warrantless electronic surveillance, argued that before both the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court. So without further ado, let me um, please introduce um, Stephen Lekar. Well, it's good to be back after 40 years. Um, I thought last night I caught a couple of minutes of the Super Bowl uh, while I was getting prepared, and um, I, I wanted to convey to you um, some thoughts, really more from the personal perspective, what it's like to do a Supreme Court case, and as well as share with you some of my thoughts for the implications of the U.S. v. Jones. But as I sat in the bar, I remember, and I hearken back to the moment that I was walking across the Supreme Court quadrangle um, in November of uh, 2011, and I saw the line stretching out from the Supreme Court doors all the way out to the street and way around, and I said to myself, boy, what have I gotten myself into? And I remember some uh, student coming up and, and wishing me well, and he, he identified me by my name, which surprised me because I certainly hadn't been in the media, at least not my picture hadn't been on, uh, uh, in the media, and um, he told me that the case had been billed as a Super Bowl of privacy. And when I heard that, I said, really, what did I get myself into? But um, once the oral argument began, I realized what I had gotten myself into, and it was a lot of fun. What I propose to talk about today is a little bit about the case itself, the underpinnings of U.S. v. Antoine Jones, and then, of course, I'll talk about its effect on pending cases and where I think it's going to have an effect on future litigation, uh, new technologies. First, let me share with you a little bit about the background of the case. 
Antoine Jones was a man whom the police believed in the D.C. area to have be a man with a golden arm. He had two prior convictions for narcotics offenses, and the authorities came to believe that he was running another narcotics ring in concert with the Mexican Mafia. <clears throat> so in, in due time, they sought and got an application to do pen registers, and uh, then they got an application to do wiretaps. They also got a warrant to put a GPS on the underpinnings of the vehicle that Mr. Jones drove. And that was the first area of the case that led to a problem for the uh, federal government because the warrant was required to be installed in D.C. within 10 days of the warrants being issued. And in true governmental fashion, for some reason, they never got around to doing it. They installed it on the 11th day and in Maryland, at which point in time it was a warrantless installation. Not only that, but uh, the, war the uh, battery died down on the GPS within days of its app installation. So they went out to Maryland without a warrant and they rebooted it. And as a result, every seven seconds of the day from the moment Antron Jones drove out the driveway of his house to the moment he came home at night, that GPS device was whirring away relentlessly, tracking every place he went onto public highways and byways. Um, he was indicted in due course, and when the uh, police took down the stash house, it was a suspected stash house, they found approximately $850,000 in cash, and they also found 95 kilos of cocaine. At the trial court level, he was represented by a first-rate trial lawyer, filed a, a motion to suppress uh, on the GPS data, among other things, and the district judge, Judge Ellen Siegel Uvell, uh, denied the motion to the suppress. The decision is cited in 2B of the outline. And Judge Uvell's reasoning was that there was Supreme Court case law from the 1980s involving beeper technology that, in her judgment, <clears throat> was applicable such that the GPS surveillance in and of itself was, uh, was lawful, Ex with the exception of information that was gathered once the car was in the garage because that revealed where Mr. Jones w was at home. And, I heard Judge Uvell reason, but that was off limits under the Supreme Court case law. Well, Antron went to trial the first time. He was indicted for conspiracy to distribute cocaine and for 11 counts, as I remember, of using the telephone to distribute, uh, nar uh, to arrange narcotics transactions. The um, FBI, uh, the FBI witnesses were anything but good. They re and this is uh, probably the first insight I'll give for those of you who want to be prosecutors or defense lawyers. I didn't do the case at the trial level, but I re certainly am familiar with the transcript. The wit FBI witnesses wanted to fight. They resisted cross-examination. They just didn't want to give straightforward answers. And as a result, the first trial, the jury acquitted Mr. Jones of all of the telecommunications count. They hung on a conspiracy count. So in due course, the case went to trial a second time, and uh, he was con Mr. Jones was convicted of the conspiracy offense and received a life sentence as a three-time loser. Um, I was appointed to represent him in the summer of, uh, I can't even remember now, it was 2008, 2009, and I remember just a blistering hot night in the D.C. jail on a Saturday night when I went down to meet with him. I remember walking out, I remember getting there about seven at night and walking out about 1.30 in the morning with uh, what a friend of mine would describe as a ginormous package of, of documents to read through. And I realized this wasn't going to be anything, uh, any small case. This was, not that I tend to do small cases, but I knew this was going to be a monster. Um, it had a lot of issues other than the GPS, but I, it struck me that the proverbial sizzle in the steak was going to be the GPS, as well as in, uh, such theories as whether the government had, had met the requirements to get a wiretap in the first place much less put a warrant, uh, have probable cause to get a warrant to, uh, to seek GPS surveillance. Um, we briefed the case and we argued it. I argued it in the DC circuit. I had a panel that was as philosophically diverse as you could possibly hope to have in the US Court of Appeals. Literally on the left, I had Judge Tatel, David Tatel, who is, I would say, fairly liberal. It's absolutely brilliant. In the middle was just, uh, Judge Douglas Ginsburg, who at one point was then the chief judge, who during the Reagan administration had been proposed for the uh, Supreme Court chief justiceship. Um, and I would consider Judge Ginsburg to be libertarian to conservative as an instinct, also a brilliant person. 
And on the right was a recent George W. Bush appointee, Judge Thomas Griffith from um, Utah, who fairly conservative. It was, again, a very, very philosophically balanced panel. I remember we were, our, uh, we were given 15 minutes aside. I had a co-counsel, so we split it up seven and a half minutes, which doesn't give you a lot of time to argue your core theory. But the court can certainly extend it. And uh, I can remember sitting down after 45 minutes of questioning, literally drenched in sweat. And I said, boy, this is the roughest time I've ever had. I had argued 25 cases up there. But they were, it was a live bench. And I, I can also recall the assistant US attorney walking up to do his argument. And he thought he had a proverbial cigar of victory in his mouth and smoking it away and having a good time. And within 45 minutes, I saw him sit down looking as dejected as I felt. So I thought this was a pretty, uh, this was a pretty live argument. Um, it took a year, it took a year for the court to reach this decision. And what I understand, uh, Judge Ginsburg went through a number of drafts uh, before the decision issued. It was a unanimous decision in Mr. Jones' favor. It's reported um, at 615 F3rd 544. It's in, uh, it's in the outline. Um, we argued two theories. The first theory I argued was that uh, putting the GPS on Mr. Jones' car was a seizure, that the government didn't have a right to do that. And then I argued that uh, following him around for this length of time, 28 days is how long he was followed re uh, remotely effortlessly by the GPS was in and of itself a violation of the Fourth Amendment under the standard Katz Doctrine. Um, one of the central parts of my argument was that the, there were several courts of appeals, two of them as I remember, the Ninth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit that had said GPS was, was fine, it was copacetic. And I remember looking at a law review article written by a woman uh, named Renee Hutchins who now teaches at University of Maryland Law School and it was entitled, All Tied Up in Knots, referring to the Knots case, and talked about GPS surveillance. And what Professor Hutchins pointed out was that the two courts of appeals were misreading Knots. They were misreading the implications of Knots. And that's what I argued in terms of my second argument. You recall the first argument was the seizure, the second argument was that this was a surveillance. It was intrusive, it was a violation under the Katz doctrine of his Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, the Court of Appeals agreed with the second argument. They didn't mention the first argument. They focused on the second argument. And Judge Ginsburg announced what he, uh, he considered the mosaic theory. It was something that Professor Hutchins had talked about, that with the GPS, it's not really a sense augmenting device. It's a mechanical sense supplanting device that allows the government to acquire an enormous amount of information about one's movements. And it allows the government to figure out where you've been every few seconds of time. Who have you seen? Are you seeing an abortion provider? Are you, going to a, uh, are you going to a gay bar? Is your wife having an affair? Is your wife pregnant? Are, she, are, you, having, are you going to get uh, baby clothes? It was an amazing, uh, beautiful piece of scholarship. In fact, I would almost describe it as professionally humbling, how nice that opinion is. And I would commend it for anybody really interested in understanding what's turned to mosaic theory. Um, the government didn't like the 3-0 result, and they sought rehearing on Bonk. And um, the, we briefed that. The court did not agree to rehear it on Bonk. There was another published opinion. The original panel adhered to its, uh, its position. Uh, the rest of the circuit broke down almost along ideological lines with the more conservative members saying that this was an invasion, this was not an invasion of the Fourth Amendment, and more liberal people were saying, yes, it was. The decision issued late, uh, uh, late in 2010, denying rehearing, and at that point, the government had to decide what they want to do. I sat down at the, uh, with the uh, Justice Department at the SG's office, at Solicitor General's office, and I tried to persuade them that, listen, I realize there's a circuit split here, but why don't you just wait and see what happens over time? And I suggested to them that if they fought this case, if they persisted, they were going to run into a firestorm of criticism from the left and the right, because this kind of behavior just didn't seem right. It just didn't feel right to put a GPS on somebody's car and track them remotely, relentlessly over time. Uh, the government sought an unprecedented three, near unprecedented three extensions of time before they decided that they were going to go ahead. Um, 
sort of a personal footnote, I can remember sitting in the Attorney General's conference, or Solicitor General's conference room, and I thought, I, when I walked in the door, I thought I was gonna have a meeting with the uh, Deputy SG and a couple other people. There were about 30 people in that room, uh, representatives of virtually every law enforcement agency and acronym under the sun. I remember being peppered with questions by them too and walking out of there thinking, well, they're gonna go forward with it, but if they wanna do it, if that's, you know, if that's their choice. When the government petitioned for certiorari uh, in the spring of uh, 2011, there was another case in the pipeline. Uh, that case, had all, the issue of GPS had been resolved adversely to the uh, petitioner. Um, and that case was, it had, the issue had come up late in the appeal. GPS had been raised early on in our case at the trial level. And that's an important thing for any of you who want to do appellate litigation. You always want to make sure, you always want to make sure of the trial court record has set forth the theories because in a criminal case, a late blooming theory that only surfaces for the first time on appeal is going to be judged by something called the plain error rule, meaning was it blindingly obvious that it should have been raised below. And when you have, you consider that two courts of appeals had already ruled at that time that GPS surveillance was fine, it would not have been governed by the plain error rule. So you had a case competing with our case for the Supreme Court certiorari. That case had the plain error issue. Ours didn't have the plain error issue. And it, I, I, my, th my belief was, and it was certainly uh, substantiated, we were gonna be the ones to get the nod. I went to Professor Dellinger, um, who I remember fondly from law school days, and I, I said to Walter, I think this is the right case, this is the right time, I think they're gonna take this case, and he agreed with me, um, and I said, Walter, I argued this case successfully in the um, D.C. Circuit, and uh, I want to argue it upstairs. He said, do you feel like you're ready? I said, absolutely not, but I will be ready. And um, so when the time came, we were the ones who were granted certiorari, and I remember that summer and that fall of 2011. I had a full-blown trial in the Virginia State Courts against a crooked accountant during that time. It took some, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of my time up, but... Basically, all I did for almost three months was walking around, ask myself questions. I mean, I'm, I'm naturally half crazy by, by nature, but this was asking myself the sort of questions that Walter told me I'd be getting asked by the Supreme Court justices, asking myself questions that had come up at moot courts. I went to a number of moot courts to get prepared. So when the day came, I felt that I would be ready. Um, I remember lying awake at night my wife would be sleeping, and there I had a, a, a little light on, a night light on, just reading my little notebook, asking myself questions and giving myself answers and reading cases. So I got to a point where I felt myself pretty thoroughly imbued in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Um, I also want to give note to the coalition we assembled. A Supreme Court case is unlike anything else because you, have ten, you can have an almost unlimited number of amicus briefs. In the D.C. Circuit, if you're going to have an amicus brief, you can only have one brief per side. All parties um, who want to be amici have to join that one brief. And we did have an amicus brief in the D.C. Circuit that was done by the ACLU, the National Capital uh, Region, and the, uh, and, um, the uh, Electronic Frontier Federation, Foundation, rather. But here, we assembled a coalition. We went out. Uh, some people came to us. We went out looking for others. We assembled a coalition from what I would say the philosophical left to the philosophical right. And I would include organizations, standard organizations like the ACLU, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, mainstream organizations such as the Constitution Project. We had a libertarian organization, the Rutherford Institute, uh, that joined in the Council on American Islamic Relations because they felt the FBI had been targeting a number of, uh, of Muslim students in the United States through GPS. We had, uh, I spent part of a summer assembling a coalition of scholars in privacy, a good bit of time on the phone talking with people, uh, privacy scholars and persuading them ultimately to join a scholar's brief uh, dealing with the privacy implications. We had uh, an originalist brief dealing with the Fourth Amendment that was written by uh, two professors, one from Toro Law School, because we know that and it's very helpful for those of you who ever get involved in constitutional litigation, 
it's helpful to have briefs that discuss what the Constitution was intended, what the particular provision of the Constitution here, the Fourth Amendment, was intended to accomplish. The government had petitioned the court to take one issue, which is whether the warrantless use of a GPS tracking device in and of itself on the public streets to monitor somebody's surveillance violated the Fourth Amendment. Um, Walter and I felt that that really was a disservice. We have a conservative court, a property-centric court, and we do have at the core behavior, but again, as I said earlier, it just didn't feel right sticking one of these devices on somebody's car about a warrant, about so much as, by your leave, do you mind if we do this? So we suggested that the court take two questions. The second question is identified on the outline, which is whether the government responded, Mr. Jo violated Mr. Jones' rights by putting the GPS on the vehicle in the first place. I argued the case in November of uh, 2011. I remember that night awakening and slapping myself on the back that I had done a good job and then realizing that I had a dream that the argument was about four hours ahead of me. And I, I said, um, well, it was a fun dream, but I think I've got some work ahead. So we did have, uh, did have oral argument, and um, oral argument at the Supreme Court is, uh, as Woody Allen, I think, once said about sex, there's nothing else quite like it. It's, uh, you're standing there, you may get one or two words out, a couple of lines, and then kaboom, the questions come one after the other. But to a great extent, to the, to the extent that I can say anything about it, the questions, questions tend to be justices posing questions to you, looking for your answers, and seeing what are you going to say, and so they're talking to one another while they're doing that. It's kind of an open dialogue, a Socratic dialogue, not just a professor talking to students, but justices talking to other justices, explaining, and you can sort of sense where their positions come. Um, I got a lot of questions that I'd anticipated. I got a couple that I hadn't anticipated. I violated a cardinal rule. You're not supposed to say anything funny in there, but um, somebody did ask me, a, I think it was Justice Alito, asked me a question, well, why shouldn't we leave this up to Congress? And my original impulse had been, was going to be, well, Burger versus United States says, yeah, you could leave it up to Congress, but really it's here and it's now and the court should deal with it. But on the spur of the moment, I said, well, I can think of 535 reasons why you shouldn't do that. And um, they actually burst out laughing. I remember the Chief Justice kind of suppressing it. Um, so I felt, this is a good sign. It took... Uh, the decision, as I said, was argued in early November, and the decision came down in January 20, on January 23rd. Uh, one of the reasons we speculated it, took so, it came out so quickly is they wanted to give guidance to law enforcement as quickly as possible. And indeed, in the aftermath of the Jones decision, the press reported that over 3,000 GPS installations were taken off vehicles, which kind of gives you an idea how pervasive this practice was. Now, the Jones case was unanimous, but it really is comprised of three decisions. The first decision, written by Justice Scalia, joined by the Chief Justice, Justice Kennedy, Justice Sotomayor, um, uh, and uh, Justice Thomas, says it's a trespass, that you can't do this. Under, it's, a, it's a classic trespass, and uh, that it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment to usurp somebody's vehicle and use it to gain information. It's a search when you do that. The question of whether a warrant was needed was never decided. All that was decided, and that's important to know, was that this was a classic search. There is a concurring decision by Justice Alito, joined by the other justices, including Justice Sotomayor, who incidentally joined the majority opinion in a concurrence. And Justice Alito rejected the trespassory theory, said, I thought we'd abandoned that a long time ago. What uh, we're going to deal with, as far as we're concerned, according to the, uh, the concurrence, is this is a straightforward violation under CATS, that most people would not believe that putting one of these devices on the car, that's not a violation, but using it to surveil somebody 28 days in this sort of intrusive, minute, moment-by-moment -moment surveillance, that violates the reasonable expectation of privacy that most people would have. And, uh, Justice Alito's opinion, which I think is just as magisterial, says that in the future, we really want to look at these things for non-trespassory non -trespassory invasions. How long, did it, how long was the surveillance? What was the nature of the crime? 
um, was, has there been legislative intervention in any, uh, any area to give us guidance as to how people feel about this sort of, uh, this sort of behavior? There is an interesting concurrence by Justice Sotomayor, and who accept, she accepts both the majority decision and the reasoning of Justice Alito. And what she says is that technology is changing very quickly. I don't have to tell you that. I mean, that's clear to all of us. And she says that as technology evolves, it's going to affect what people view as a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that a lot of people will put out private, what they believe to be private information, but yet they're revealing it, like to the phone companies, to the banks, things like that, using the internet. And they might think that that's protected. The question is, is it protected? Because there's an important corollary to take out of it. It's called the third party doctrine. For those of you who've had criminal law or intend to take criminal law, there's a theory that came out a number of years ago with the phone company cases and the bank record cases that when you turn over information, like your checks to the bank, and they, they access your information in the normal course of business, that you have no Fourth Amendment rights because it's information in the possession of third parties. Justice Sotomayor said, I think we may need to rethink that. I think we need to, according to Justice Sotomayor, the nature of technology is changing so much that sometimes people have no choice, realistically, but to reveal information in, to third parties that they might expect would be private. I want to return to that in a little bit because when we talk about some of the new areas of technology, but I think it's important to notice Justice Sotomayor's opinion. I want to give, if I could, a quick detour of what happened to Mr. Jones, to those of you who are interested. As today, he is uh, defending his third trial. He's representing himself pro se. Um, he was another terrific lawyer was appointed to represent him at the district court level. He rejected a plea offer. He lost two motions to suppress, which are discussed, and I will discuss them in a little bit. Decided to wage the war on his own, and he's in his second week of trial again in front of Judge Uvell. Um, there's a section in my outline that I called pending cases. This is probably, I did this in, uh, as much for those of you who were taking criminal law or will take criminal law or criminal procedure as, um, as for those who won't. But I wanted to make sure that people understand some of the theories as best I can articulate it of Fourth Amendment jurisprudence so that you get a sense that the pending cases of the vast arsenal that the government has in defending its behavior even as to a practice that has been found unconstitutional. Um, again, Jones didn't reach the issue of whether warrantless GPS search in that case was unreasonable. But in general, if you're going to have a, a, a warrantless search, the Supreme Court held, has held for a number of years that it's per se unreasonable, absent certain narrowly defined circumstances. One thing the government tried to say, they're a little late saying it in the Jones case, they tried to invoke the classic automobile search exception to the Fourth Amendment. Now that exception goes back to the 1920s and it's based on the premise that an automobile was very mobile and evidence could be destroyed before the authorities can do anything about it. But in a GPS circumstance, in a case of GPS, the device is typically put on the car for long range surveillance such that if you know you're going, it, it's not put on a car at a moment that you necessarily know that there are con there's contraband in the vehicle. And that's what the automobile exception was designed to, to deal with. Is there contraband in the vehicle such that you need very quick action? If the government is going to be following somebody over a lengthy period of time, the courts have typically held the automobile exception doesn't apply. And I think that would be the same here. Um, there are certainly cases uh, that are dealing with what's called reasonable suspicion, which is a lesser standard than probable cause, something like the so-called Terry versus Ohio uh, stop and frisk theory. Um, there are cases, the cases that are dealing with reasonable suspicion include searches of parolees' homes, uh, border checkpoints, luggage, luggage at an airport if it's, a very, if it's a very brief investigatory stop. But again, the use of GPS is typically done on a long-term basis. It's not something that's done for an isolated moment. The government is obviously using it 
I could harken back to Judge Ginsburg's uh, mo uh, mosaic theory, the government's using it to put together a mosaic of somebody's movement over time, see who they're associating with, where they're going, where they're meeting. And um, so I would suggest to you that the idea of reasonable suspicion, which is a lesser standard than probable cause, will not uh, hold much sway in the courts. Um, for example, there's a recent case called United States versus Ortiz I, I cited on page three of the outline that does a pretty decent analysis and basically says GPS is a highly intrusive uh, long-range device. It's not something that's a, a spur-of-the-moment uh, uh, confrontation between the police and the target. There may be a question in, in GPS matters of what fruits of an illegal GPS surveillance can be suppressed. And here again, the government has got a lot of defenses. The government can sometimes say, well, if we had an informant who came into court uh, or witness a live body who perfectly who's here on a voluntary basis, and a court would tend to say, okay, the defendant would have the burden of proving that the informant was there on an involuntary basis. But typically, a live body can come testify, even though if the underlying GPS surveillance was, um, was illegal. There's a, uh, a theory of Franks versus Delaware. Was the warrant, if there was a warrant for GPS, was the warrant based on false information? Or was it based on information, or was there, what, let me back up. Was a warrant issued that was based on false information or information that was obtained by a GPS device? If you can strip that out, if you can strip out information from a warrant that was illegally obtained and the warrant can stand on its own, then under Franks versus United States, the warrant is, is still valid and the police can use the, uh, in the fruits of that uh, of the warrant. There are a couple other cases that are fairly well known, Murray versus United States and Nix versus United States. These are uh, uh, dealing with the independent search doctrine and the inevitable discovery doctrine. Both of these uh, theories have come into play in Mr. Jones' recent case. And what they stand for is this. Murray basically says, suppose you have an illegal search. But later on, you do a subsequent search, and it wasn't due to the, uh, uh, it wasn't any way attributed to the initial search. If a subsequent search was independently done, and it wasn't done with fruits gained from the illegal search, it can be validated. And in fact, to Mr. Jones' great chagrin, uh, that's happened um, uh, in, in one of the recent cases that's come down in, in his own case. The theory of Nix versus Williams, that's the Supreme Court case that's called the inevitable discovery doctrine. And what Nix says is this, essentially if the police were going to find it sooner or later, that uh, irrespective of whether there was bad, a bad, in this case, GPS surveillance, then the police can use that uh, information at trial. And in Mr. Jones' third trial, one of the issues that came up was, and has been decided by Judge Uvell, is did the police develop that information independent of the GPS? And she ruled that they had. The government is not going to use the GPS information at Mr. Jones' third trial. But what they said and persuaded Judge Uvell was effectively this, if I could speak in the vernacular. Listen, we already knew all about it. We had a, we had a Title III wiretap. We had suspicious phone calls. We had, a, uh, we had an idea what a pole light was. We had, uh, I'm sorry, what a house stash house was. We had a pole camera there. We had live surveillance. We saw a meeting there. The house was unusual, was a seemingly abandoned house in an otherwise well-kept neighborhood. The, and she ruled that uh, that was an inevitable discovery uh, exception and allowed the, G, the evidence in irrespective, evidence of the drugs and cash in the house, irrespective of the GPS information. There are certainly there are theories of good faith reliance. Did the government have good faith reliance on binding precedent at the time of the GPS surveillance? For example, there are cases in the Eighth Circuit, which by the time Jones was argued had ruled GPS was fine, the Seventh Circuit, which had ruled GPS was fine, and the Ninth Circuit, which had ruled GPS was fine. Cases, uh, there's a doctrine called, uh, it was developed in Davis versus United States, that essentially says if in your circuit a court of appeals had ruled definitively on a legal issue and the government has acted in good faith and there are decisions in those circuits now at the trial court level that have ruled that GPS 
surveillance is fine, even if the officers acted in good faith because those circuits had ruled that GPS was permissible. Conversely, there are decisions, and I cited some in areas such as the Third Circuit and the Sixth Circuit, which hadn't ruled on GPS, and they, said, they have said that the officers did not act in good faith. There's a pretty robust debate among the courts on the issue of good faith. I've tried to cite some of the cases for you on pages, um, pages three and four. Um, and I think uh, if there were one I was going to commend, it would be the case out of Kentucky, United States versus Lee, which I think is a pretty good discussion of a doctrine. So that brings me to where are we today. One of the things Margaret asked me to talk about is from my perspective, what do I think Jones is going to mean for the future? Well, um, for trespassory invasions of privacy, it's a no-brainer. If they put a GPS or similar uh, device on, on somebody's car or in somebody, inside somebody's house, that's going to be an easy case. That's going to be governed by the uh, Scalia test. But supposing it's a non-trespassory invasion of privacy, then I think you have to deal with the Alito test, with the standard cat's rationale. I try to cite forth some, some, uh, set forth some ideas, such as self-site location records. Well, as I'm sure all of you now know, every time you use your cell phone, you're letting somebody know, your cell phone provider, among other people, approximately where you are. And the question is, can the government get these sort of records either on a historical basis? Can they go to the phone company, a third party, and say, listen, we'd like Steve LaCar's cell site location records. Or can they get a warrant, or actually not a warrant, can they get an application through a United States magistrate judge, and can they go to a phone company and say, we'd like to know where Steve LaCar is going to be going over the next few months of a perspective, a, a, a perspective of a roving surveillance. <coughs> Are these permissible? Here again, there's, uh, there's been a, a, a lot of litigation now among the courts. I think the majority of the cases are saying that in the case of historical data, the government needs a, uh, a, needs a warrant. In the case of perspective uh, uh, data, it's not so clear whether, uh, where the law is going to go. And this is all going to have to be shaken out ultimately at the appellate and the Supreme Court level. There's a, uh, a good decision out of the Southern District of Texas that was argued before the Fifth Circuit. I think a case has been, it still hasn't been reported, it was argued about a year ago, that may start breaking open the contours of the cell site location uh, issue. What about things like emails, internet searches, text messages? I think it's pretty clear the way the courts are going that these are going to be treated much as letters. Under the Fourth Amendment, the government can take a letter and they can see where it's going to, but they can't open the letter. And there are several cases that have come down at the appellate level. I cited a number of, number of them on page five that have basically said, well, the government can access, uh, they can certainly see where the emails are going to, but without a warrant, without probable cause, they, uh, they can't examine the content of email. Uh, that's also true of things like text messages that people are being held, are held to have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the content of a text message, although not necessarily who the text message is going to. Um, tweets, there's no expectation of privacy because that's being disseminated to the wide world. Uh, things like prolonged visual surveillance, that's going to be uh, getting litigated because, um, in fact, going to be getting litigated a lot more. For example, it's one thing if you have a camera in following people in various, in, in, in various neighborhoods, and if you happen to show up while you're walking through the neighborhood, is that a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Uh, what's going to happen if they're targeting you, if the police have to decide to target you and watch you as you go from neighborhood to neighborhood on a pervasive basis? What if the police put a pole camera on the back of uh, a couple of blocks from, in a tree a couple of blocks from your house, and watch what's going on in the curtilage of your home or inside the home. Is that, is that a Fourth Amendment violation? Here again, I've tried to suggest some, uh, some cases that deal with this issue. It may not be a Fourth Amendment violation if all they're doing is, to, is, is the backyard on a periodic basis. If they're doing it on a continuous basis, it may well be a Fourth Amendment violation. Um, things such as nanotechnology, drone technology, um, that's going to be, I think, a, a, an area of enormous possible developing law. I talked about this with Margaret a little while ago because 
The FAA is only now licensing, allowing people to have drones, commercial drones, uh, to, and you can only imagine the use to which drones can be put to. I mean, it's one thing, for example, if you have a real estate agent who wants to use a drone to go out and take pictures so to show prospective clients what a nice neighborhood you have. But what if the government wants to use the drone to follow you around from day to day? Is that a Fourth Amendment violation? You know, one might argue, well, you're out in public which is sort of the argument the government used in the Jones case, and the Supreme Court said, no, that's not enough, because people have a legitimate expectation you're not going to be followed on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Um, drone, I think drone technology is of, of a similar genre. What about things such as uh, other issues of nanotechnology? There's uh, the New York Police Department reportedly has a device that can sense heat, met, uh, can compare the heat coming off your body with metal such that if one of you were sitting here with a vest that might be packing some real heat, the New York device could uh, take from about 30 feet away and could, could detect the presence of a pistol or a handgun inside somebody's clothing. Is that a Fourth Amendment violation? I mean, I'm not here to give you the answer. I'm here to tell you the implications that are going to follow from Jones, I think, are just staggering. Um, there, in my humble opinion, uh, what really needs to be done is the Congress has got to deal with this on a comprehensive basis. There was some effort to get it done, uh, over, there have been efforts to deal with GPS and, and new emerging technologies over the year. It picked up some traction last session of Congress uh, when uh, Rep uh, Senator Wyden and Representative Chaffetz had uh, litigation and Senators Franken and Blumenthal had, uh, had legislation. But Nothing has come to pass yet, but I, I do actually agree with Justice Toledo, um, with, not just with his test, but I also agree with something else he pointed out. Really, this should be in the hands of Congress, but Congress being what Congress tends to be as dysfunctional as we all know it to be, Lord knows when something is going to happen in that regard. Um, Margaret asked me what, what did I think overall was going to happen in light of U.S. v. Jones. And I think what Jones is, um, I'm pleased that people have referred to it as a landmark case. I think that you can take a lot out of Jones. As uh, There's a recent article in the Harvard Law Review points out, you can take Justice Scalia's decision, dealing with a tresp which reinvigorated the, uh, the trespassory theory of Fourth Amendment violation. You can take Justice Alito's theory, uh, his concurrence, where he talks about the cat's expectation privacy test. And you can take Justice Sotomayor, uh, rather beautifully written concurrence, which takes the best of all worlds, which borrows from both camps. There's a lot to be, uh, to be found in Jones for future litigation and uh, for policymakers. It's, um, I'm grateful that I had a chance to argue, argue the case. I'm obviously delighted with the result because a Fourth Amendment victory for a defendant has not been, uh, not been occurring with too much regularity in the Supreme Court. But this was a case that I think established that there is a point at which the government can go too far. And um, this was that such case. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Thank you. So um, we can now have some questions for about 15 minutes. Does anyone have any questions for Steve McCart? Yeah, not to read tea leaves, but um, do you have any idea where Scalia might come out uh, if there wasn't the trespassory hook to hang his hat on? Because he made a point to say that it may be different without that, and that cats is fine and is a good test, but this one's is easier in this case. So, um, I suspect had we not argued the case the way we did, it, all, it would have come out maybe with a different n uh, number. It wouldn't have been 9-0 broken up the way it was. I don't think he liked this behavior. Um, the clearest sign of all of this was the first question out of the gate that Justice Roberts posed to Michael Dreeben, which was, you saying you can do this to any of us? And um, there's a point in the Supreme Court that it just resonates. And in that moment, I remember giving Walter a little note. I said, maybe I don't need to stand up and argue and you sent me back little notes. I think you do. But I, I, I mean, I don't think Scalia, Justice Scalia liked this one bit. Um, but I want to make clear to you, because we recognize that we have a very conservative court. 
And above all, I wanted to win this case for Antoine Jones. I wanted to couch it in the narrowest grounds possible. And to me, the trespassory theory was the easiest one to resolve. Because when you talk about cats, you're in essence asking a court to be a super legislature to guess where society is. I mean, and it's not like they're going to stay at night making telephone calls around the country. What do you think about, uh, about reasonable expectation of privacy? They've got to guess where society is on any given point. So I do believe that Scalia, Justice Scalia, would have come out the same way, but it was a function of the way we pitched the case. It's protecting Mr. Jones, winning the case in the narrowest way possible while perhaps developing new law. So on the reasonable expectation of privacy, I'm wondering where you and you think Justice Alito are getting that idea, given all of what you said about how we've got drones, we've got on the way to nanotechnology with nanocameras and being able to track everyone. Why does anyone have any expectation of privacy in the public and how can you say that that expectation is reasonable? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, obviously, I think you, you have to, how can you say the, uh, that a given expectation of privacy is reasonable? Again, you almost have to guess. That's, the, that's the, 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 one of the disturbing parts of electronic, uh, of emerging electronic surveillance technology, which is why I believe that Congress, the legislature, has got to sit down and address this. Courts are reactive. Courts are sitting with a static set of facts. And in a situation where the law is not clearly developed, and you're talking new technology, you're asking courts to divine, almost to, to be Karnak the, uh, the magician and come up with what's the right answer. Um, you have to look to our legislatures, have legis state legislatures written about this? Are there a lot of commentary and law review on this or any lower court decisions that are dealing with this? It's a very difficult test. I mean, that's what made Jones in one respect easy because it was an invasion of the, guy, of the car. On the other hand, you have Justice Alito saying, well, how do we decide? And what he said, what he ultimately came down is, with, as, I, as my reading of it, was this is just too long. 28 days of, of watching somebody, actually it wasn't even watching, they were letting the device do it. Um, where you have a, a machine that basically supplants human sense, where it's a substitute for police, actual police surveillance, where it's a cheap, uh, cheap way for the government to follow somebody, I think the courts would react to those, those type of devices with some concern. If it's intermittent surveillance, then, you have a little, then it's a little, the government's certainly going to be given a lot more leeway. There are no simple answers in this area. That's the, I don't want to say that's the problem, but that's the reality. I hate to think of... Um, so you... You mentioned you listed some of these cases about email messages um, and how courts are starting to treat them kind of like letters. And uh, that seems to be a little different than what the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, um, their standard for um, allowing government to look at uh, emails, electronic communications that are stored on servers for over 180 days. Um, does it, does it seem like courts are saying, look, the Congress hasn't acted, on, or they've acted in such a way that it's so far behind the times that we can't rely on that anymore. We have to be proactive and come up with our own. Well, one of the problems with the statutes is the statutes don't necessarily have a suppression remedy. So what you've got to deal with is the good old standard Fourth Amendment test. Um, that's why they really need to have statutes that have teeth that say you can't do this, that for example, if you're gonna do this, you've gotta satisfy a judge that, for, that there's probable cause, that you really need to do it at this point in time, a so-called necessity requirement that's required of wiretaps. You gotta establish a judge, to a judge's satisfaction that you're gonna minimize the extent that you're gonna invade innocent people's uh, uh, privacy. For example, in the Jones case, the, uh, the car it was, Antoine Jones had the exclusive use of it, but it was his wife's car. Now, supposing they had picked her up driving. She wasn't a target or a suspect in the case, but supposing she was driving around. I mean, you, what I, uh, so what you come back to, the statutes that are in existence now are, in my humble opinion, flaccid. They really don't have good suppression remedies. 
That's why I, I would recommend, I, I, I strongly think Congress needs to pass statutes with teeth. Then you don't have to worry about Fourth Amendment issues. Then you got all you have to ask yourself, or a court has to ask yourself, did the government meet the statutory criteria? And we've had, what is it, 40 years now of litigation involving wiretaps. It all started with a Fourth Amendment case, and then Congress reacted by passing comprehensive legislation. So you assess the actual facts of the agent's behavior versus the legislation. You ask yourself, does it pass that test? It makes it a lot easier than a court simply saying to itself, scratching its head and saying, wow, is this a Fourth Amendment violation or not? I mean, they, they need comprehensive legislation. Uh, yes. uh, so, in this case, people will be here says there's no expectation of privacy in tweets, and I assume that's because like your tweet is going out to like the whole world, and anyone can see it. Does that also apply if the tweets are like blocked, or you know, where instead of sending it out to everyone, you're sending it out to like a, a defined people? I would I would say not to blocks, um, because with the content, not to the content. But if, you, if you're sending it not to everybody indiscriminately, but if you're sending it to a select group of people. I think you were, uh, the, well, I haven't, I haven't seen any cases on that recently, but I don't see any conceptual difference between sending, me sending you an email and me sending 10 of you an email, because I think under the, under the what I'll call the Alito concurrence, I still have a reasonable expectation, but it's the effect, and essentially, I'm sending you guys each letters. I think I should have a degree of privacy in that. And I, I, I know uh, I'm fairly comfortable that if this were a standard letter, it would get protection. So I, I don't see why it would be any different if, uh, as long as I'm not being indiscriminate in who I'm sending uh, my correspondence to, my electronic correspondence to. You know, but like a tweet, you would send it out to all your followers. So let's say I have 500 followers, so it would go indiscriminately to those 500 people, but only to those 500 people. Do you think that that still would qualify closer to a letter or closer to a Well, I, I, I would argue that it's still closer to a letter. I could, but I, in, in candor, I could see a court rejecting that as well. I mean, that, here again, I come back to the same situation. Absent comprehensive legislation, it's just my opinion. You know, you're, you're essentially guessing where a court's going to go. Well, what I would like to say to you all is that um, you are going to be going out into a universe as lawyers where you're going to be dealing with a, what I, I don't want to necessarily call it a surveillance state, but a state in which it's easy with technology to follow people around and to invade people's privacy. And I would just hope that, um, that you're guided, perhaps by Jones, and by an, expert, an understanding of common sense as to what this country was founded upon. It was, they're basically, the Fourth Amendment was designed um, to make sure to be a balance between the individual's right to privacy and the right of a government to ferret out crime. And, and, and really, the idea of the government having a standardless discretion to do whatever it wants to do with electronic information is a, a, a matter, I think, of some concern to most civil libertarians. And I hope it's of concern to you as you go out and practice law. Or, but yet, as you make public policy. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.